Good evening. If you've been here for five days, or you've been here for five weeks, or you've been here for 50 years, you can tell that First Baptist Church Millington has a lot going on, does it not? There's just a whole lot going on, and, and, and it does require prayer. It does require uh, your participation, and we got the VBS coming up, and pastors going here, coming back, and so here's what I want you to do. Everybody breathe in. Let it out. Now do it one more time. Breathe in. Breathe out. God's got this. It's not a surprise. God's got him. Um, I want to do something a little different this evening, uh, but it's not going to be the main subject of it. It's just uh, it's kind of like the catalyst to get us started in our storyline. Uh, tonight, I want to start the session out with a personal story. Uh, the personal story begins this past weekend. Miss Myrna and I celebrated our 42nd wedding anniversary. And uh, 65, we got a ways to catch up with you, and I'll be taking notes. I'll be coming talking with you to figure out how to get the next 23 years there, you know. So, uh, But anyway, uh, when Myrna and I first met, it was the spring of 1980. And I just returned to San Diego off an extended cruise on the USS Coral Sea. We had a normal Westpac that we were scheduled to go on, but we got extended another uh, 60 days out because of the uh, Iranian hostage crisis. And I was part of the team at the Iranian hostage crisis there with uh, the helicopter squadron uh, that was there with that. And uh, so when I came back, uh, that young sweet lady, or I call her the uh, soft sweet voice, and she says, don't say that, uh, but the soft sweet voice, I met her. Uh, I won't get in how we met, that's for you ladies to talk. That's her story, so I'll let her tell that story. But uh, bottom line is, we dated for about a year, a little over a year in San Diego before we were married on June the 11th, 1981. It was a small little wedding. Neither her parents or my family could attend, so we headed to the marriage chapel alone. So between the chaplain, his secretary, and the two of us, we were soon husband and wife. Once I returned off of that cruise, I had orders in hand. I was scheduled to head to Kingsville, Texas for instructor duty. Why is that important is because we were in San Diego, Kingsville, Texas is on the Gulf of Mexico, and I could swing by Fort Worth area and see my parents and introduce my family to my new lovely bride for the first time. After a few days there with the family, everything was going well. Everything was going well the whole time we were there, so don't get me wrong on that. But my dad had a special presentation. He kind of called us in the living room and everything, and he kind of, uh, my dad was special that way as far as he wanted to make, a, make it that moment important. And so uh, he made a special presentation. It was more to me, uh, but Myrna was there beside me. He wanted us to have this Bible. It was, it was a special Bible. In fact, it's a Dr. Creswell study Bible. And Dr. Creswell just finished. He's the First Baptist Church of Dallas. And uh, it was his new study Bible. And my dad had gone out of his way to get one for every member of his family. But it wasn't what made it special. It wasn't that it was a Dr. Creswell study Bible. It wasn't that it was given to me by my dad that made it special. It wasn't that, hey, God's word is special all in itself. It doesn't need anything else. It's God's word. But remember, you might not remember, but what I'll say here is I was lost at the time. So it didn't have that impact that it does most of us right now. But what made the impact is my dad endorsed it. He gave a personal endorsement on it. And that made it special. But what made it special is tonight's message. He said, son... When you were small, I told you a story about how the wise man built his house on a rock, while the foolish man builds his house on sand. And the rains came, and the foolish man's house fell, Matthew 7, 24. Now here you are, a grown man, and I'm telling you again how the wise man builds his house on a rock. This rock is Jesus. The only way that any home can stand the pains of today is for the father and mother to build their house on Jesus. Please, Curtis Lynn, put God first in your home. Love, Dad. 
And then it has a PS on it. It says, may this Bible, it may this God's word be your foundation. Now, I would love to tell everyone in here that I took heart to that message and I, I just made the Bible the first thing. I made God the beginning of our life. That was a foundation stone. But God, I, I have to confess before God and y'all that that's not true. It wasn't true because when we took this, we knew it was important. We knew it was special. But we found a box that this fit perfectly in. And we put this Bible in that box. And for the next 13, 14 years, seven different major moves, four different duty stations, we had it under our bed. It was important, but we had God's word slid under the bed. Now, I was lost. I was raised in a church. I knew all the churchy things to do. But this Bible was put in a special box and put under the bed. Until we came back after 13 years, Proverbs 26 tells us that if we were raised up in a church slash godly home, then we would come back, right? Isn't that what it says? No, it says, train up a child in the ways he should go, and even when he's old, he will not depart in it. Now, Pastor Derek's already mentioned the fact that that doesn't always happen, but pretty much it's, it's, a, it's a, a overall general statement. Well, for me, it was true. For me, it was true. It just took me a little, I'm a little hard-headed. I'm a little slow. It took me a while to figure it out. But the answer is true. It was a true statement for me. My family returned from a long overseas tour of duty. Uh, one of the duty stations that we went was overseas, uh, we'd been away from the country, uh, away from the United States for almost nine years. When we came back from overseas, got stationed here in the Millington area, got a house here in the area, and one of my new friends invited me to a local church. After putting him off for many times, we finally went. Took my wife and my family, and we went to the local church with him. And guess what? I pulled the Bible out. And being a good, godly Christian that I thought I was at the time, I got my own Bible, too. So I don't know if I had a suit and tie on, and I looked all the ways. I don't know what it is, but we went to that. But through that invitation, God transformed both of us, which led to both of us coming to know the Lord, which means our family came thereafter, followed suit, and came to know the Lord. And I boast on that because through that process, I have a son that's in Guatemala as a missionary and been down there for the last eight years. And so the passing on of the lineage is there. That brings us to the night study. You should have your outline there. If you have your outline, I'd like you to do something first because there's a, a section on there that I misprinted, and I didn't read it like I should. I've already talked to uh, Pastor Billy about it. If you look at uh, outline, external appearance, number one, number two, internal appearance, number three, eternal appearance, Item B says that we, we will all receive eternal life. That should be we will all have eternal life. But he corrected me too. He said, well, we are going to receive it in some way, but I don't want to play semantics on that. I don't want somebody to run up to Pastor Derek and say, I'm teaching false doctrine. Because we don't all, we're not going to be granted eternal life in that sense, life, but we will all have eternity. We will spend eternity somewhere, and I'll get to that in a minute. So that brings us to, what was the charge my dad gave me? He wanted me to build a house on a rock. So let's take a look at that. Matthew 7, 24 through 27. Therefore, whosoever hears these sayings of mine and does them will be likened unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rains descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon the house and it fell not for it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that hears these sayings of mine and do them not shall be likened to a foolish man which builds his house upon the sand. And the rains descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. Now, that was out of King James Version. Some of you may have other words, but this is a King James Bible and this is on its second cover. 
Because once God got a hold of me, I took this Bible and I've been studying it, carrying it, preaching it, carrying around the rest of the world because <clears throat> I had another, thir- uh, another 12 years overseas of tours of duty and this Bible never left my side. It's my go-to Bible. The charge was is to build your house upon a rock and what is that rock? Well, if we went, all went through Pastor David's, uh, Pastor David, Pastor, Pastor Derek's uh, hermeneutic studies. How many of you here was with Pastor Derek and his her- hermeneutics, right? Most everybody in here? Well, we, got, we know that we have to learn that uh, we need to look at the content of the message. We need to know who's speaking, who's he speaking it to, and pretty much what it's about. This is the last lesson on the Sermon on the Mount. If you have your Bibles and you want to open up to chapter 5 of Matthew, you'll see the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. Now, I am not going to cover every item on the Sermon on the Mount. I'm going to do a high-level Passover, if you will, and you can kind of flip through. But one thing we're going to look at is we got to see what the therefore of this subject was. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine. So what was he talking about? Jesus was on the Sermon on the Mount. He was in the western, uh, western Galilee area. He's on the shores of the, uh, the Sea of Galilee on the western side, just kind of around almost a nine o'clock position from Capernaum. And he had been walking around and he has been healing. He's been, uh, you know, he, he, he's, he's on that hill uh, walking through there. He's been healing. He's been casting out demons, feeding the thousands, turning water into wine. And more people kept following him and bringing more people to him to be healed. And he was going through all this. And Jesus was saying, the whole time he was saying all this, all through the sermon, he was saying, repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. What else was Jesus preaching? As you scan through the Sermon on the Mount, you'll see that he spoke of the blessed and the Beatitudes. And that we're to be the salt and light of the world. That Jesus came to fulfill the law of Moses and the prophets. He told us not to be angry with people, that we should love our neighbors. Do not commit sexual immorality. He also cleared up a misunderstanding of the times on divorce and on how we're to give oaths or we're supposed to swear truths or talk about truths. Again, he talked on retaliation and that we are to love our enemies. He told us how we're to give to the needy. How he gave to us and them the model to pray, gave us the Lord's Prayer. He spoke on fasting, and it should be between you and God and not for everybody to see. We're to lay up our treasures in heaven and not here on earth. And we're not to be anxious, but to seek him first in his righteousness. Not to be judges as the Pharisees did, or those that think they're more righteous than others. And that we can ask, and it'll be given to us. That we can seek, and he'll reveal it to us when we seek in Jesus. And that we're to do unto others as you would have others do unto you. He went on to say that the way to enter the kingdom is but a narrow way. Many will miss it. He explained about that we're the fruit and that what would happen to a tree that bears bad fruit. He lovingly stated that many will be cast away because he never knew them. Even if we know all these things, but we do not do them, we may not enter the kingdom of heaven. Remember the charge from my dad is build our house on a rock, the rock of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the foundation stone. He is the foundation stone for us to have eternal life with him. And without Jesus... It's just man's way of getting through this world and having eternal torment. My dad's charge that day that he gave me this Bible was pretty powerful because the walk that I've had since that time that I came to know the Lord, compared to the time before I knew the Lord, there is no comparison. The events and the things that God has revealed to my wife and I over these course of these years of building my foundation on him and casting away all the old has been absolutely amazing. I would like to just say a cliche that it was a God thing, but it, it was. 
And it is. But your outline there has three items. External appearance. When Jesus was speaking to them, there was Pharisees there. There were scribes there. There were people more righteous than others walking around. How did they look? How do we look when we walk through the walls, the halls, the businesses, the schools, the places that we're employment? Do we walk around more righteous and haughtier than those around that do not know Jesus? Do we walk around and look at people based on how their appearance are? Because they did. They put on royal, royal, royal robes and fancy clothes. Luke 20, 45 through 47 says, this is uh, external appearance, how we see others look. And while all the people were listening, he said to the disciples, beware of the scribes who walk around in long robes, love personal greetings in the marketplace, and chief seats in the synagogues and place of honor in banquets, who devours widows' houses for the appearance sake, they offer long prayers, these will receive all the more condemnation. Others pray out loud. I knew a man one time, and he was very eloquent in speech. Very, very eloquent in speech. He used to publicly pray all the time, wherever we were at, whenever it was going on. A few years later, I found out that his life was in shambles. It's as if he never knew God. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, the other was a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself to pray. God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, even like the tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth till I get out. See, some people think that they're better than everybody else. They see themselves that way, their outward appearance of things they do. They feel more pride. They give to the poor and needy publicly so that all can see. In Matthew 6, 1 and 2, it says, Take care not to practice your righteousness in the sight of people, to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. So when you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues on the streets so that they will be praised by people. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. But when you give to the poor, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your charitable giving will be in secret, and your Father who sees what is done is in secret will reward you. So many people want to take our treasures and pass it on and pat yourselves on the back and look at what I gave, look what I did, look at this. But when everybody else publicly praises you for that, you just got your reward. Their reward is like hay and stubble. It's going to pass away. But if you do a charitable act out of the love of God, let God be the only one to see that. These are what Jesus is speaking of on the Sermon on the Mount. This is what he's telling them. It is a transformation for the way they believe. It's a transformation for what they normally went through their whole life. The Pharisees, oh man, Jesus radically changed their life. You talk about a thorn in his eyes. He even says that, do not judge other people. Don't go up and tell somebody they got a splinter in their eye or what they're doing wrong when you got a plank in yours. These are powerful words. They're directive words that he was telling. He was telling specific people who judge other people. One of the most common words that he uses all the time that he talked about is that everybody says, if you have a lost person in your workplace, you've probably heard this. Ah, oh, you're not supposed to judge. Don't judge me. Is that what it says? It says, judge not lest you be judged. For the matter that you judge others, then you're going to be judged by that same. So if I bring a ruler up and I judge you by that ruler, that ruler is going to be brought right back on me and judge me for everything I just said. That's not an old me, that's an old mine. Jesus is telling these self made righteous people that their hearts are wicked. I've had somebody tell me, said, Yeah, I love the Sermon on the Mount. I said, I want to live my life by the Sermon on the Mount. 
You cannot live your life by the Sermon on the Mount. Now, I'd heard that many times, but in the study of this lesson, I have read the study Sermon on the Mount in at least four or five different translations in the last few days. And they all say the same, Curtis, you can't even live that way. He radically steps on toes. He tells them that their way of life, guys, he points to them and everything about it. You know what they're pointing at? It's pointing at that we all need a savior. We are all foul. We're all sinners. We're all like filthy rags. But Jesus was loving and teaching them to get them to remember. But at the same time, he's getting them to reflect on who he was. I don't be there. It says, what do we think we look like? 1 Peter 3, 3, through 4, uh, 3 and 4. Do not let your adorning be external, the braids of your hair, putting on jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which God's sight is very precious. Proverbs, 30, uh, Proverbs 31 and thir- uh, through 30. 31 and 30, charm is deceitful, beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Hallelujah. We walk around thinking that we're perfect inside. If we're so perfect inside, why do we always comb our hair? If we're all perfect and we think we're all perfect, why do we always trim our nails and make ourselves look better than we are? King Solomon said, vanity, 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 right? But it's our heart. How do we see ourselves? How do we see ourselves? Matthew 23, 28. So you also outwardly appearance righteous to others, but within you you're full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Bam. Bam. Did I get home? Now, when I'm reading all these and when I studied this and I was going through this again, I was putting myself back the way I was. Meaning that I was back where I was at as a kid. My mom and dad, my dad had a desire to be a pastor. He had a desire to be a senior deacon, then he's going to be a senior pastor. So at night, before I was at a negative nine months, I was going to church. When I was born, I was going to church. I showed it to a couple of people the other day. I pulled it out. In 1970, I was baptized in a church. But being in Texas, that baptismal was no more than you take your dog and put him in a tick bath, get him clean. It didn't mean anything. It didn't transfer me then. I was a smelly kid in Texas, okay? That was probably the only bath I had that week. I say that because just because what I did in that baptismal, it didn't change my life. It wasn't the waters were so special it transformed my life. Because I had a great head knowledge. I got the little stars for the Bible drills. I got the stars for, you know, attending the Royal Ambassadors. I had the little badges that you get from Royal Ambassadors. And then we had a Cub Scout part of our church, and then went on in Boy Scouts. I've been wearing a uniform since I was six years old. I went from Cub Scouts all through Boy Scouts and went into 17 in the United States Navy and never got rid of my merit badge. I just wanted more. But all those years raised in that church, all those years of going there and listening to those sermons, well, sitting with those sermons, it never once transformed my heart. But I thought I was a Christian. Right after the Iranian hostage crisis, we were coming back out of that scenario. And the ship pulled into Singapore, and we went to a restaurant. There's about six of us there. And we went to this restaurant, and this was a, the Arab section. It was an Arab section of the city. And we were getting something to eat. And one of the... Uh, Gentleman waiter, he'd come up and he started talking to us and he got on religion. He was asking us what religion was. And I was very proud. I said, I'm a Christian. 
He goes, why are you a Christian? You wouldn't believe the answer I gave. Well, maybe some of you, you know me. I'm an American. Of course I'm a Christian. My parents go to church. Looking back on that, that was really, really, really. I think they, I even think that that gentleman even knew that I was lost. As my daughter-in-law would say, I was lost as a goose in a horse race. You know, yeah, I was lost. So what we think we look like, what does God see? When God looks at us, what does he see? We have to remember this. I got them in uh, backwards orders. If you did it, that's fine. We'll go over. But Genesis 1, 27. So God created man in his image. In his image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Male and female, he created him. I won't go any further on that. It's God's word. You got a problem with that? Take it up with him. Genesis 1, 26 says, And then God says, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heaven, and over the livestock, over the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on earth. There's a real good passage in Romans chapter 1 who said that they started worshiping the creator or the created things instead of the creator. When we take our eyes off the creator and we start looking at the creation, we're not holy. You're highly unholy. God sees us in his image that he created us to have fellowship one along with him, to spend all eternity with him, to care for the things of this world, to take care of the things of this world, and to create other likenesses of him. He said, go out and appropriate. Our society is transformed so much radically right now, they want to create, they want to prevent an increase in population, which God says he wants us to do. But they want to go out and kill babies before they're, well, how much, it used to be sacred that how, how protected a baby was in his mother's womb. And now if a baby can think when he's in his mother's womb, he's like, okay, what chance do I have of surviving this? Lord, I ask you to guard my heart if I started to stray. The eternal appearance, how God sees your heart. People look at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. 1 Samuel 16, 7. And Jeremiah 17, 10. I, the Lord, searches the heart and tests the mind to give every man, every man according his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. Matthew 5, 8. Blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. Proverbs 21, 2. Every way a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs his heart. I used to think I was real good. Oh, I knew I didn't murder anybody. I knew I didn't kill anybody. I didn't rob a bank. So comparatively speaking, I was better than most of the people around me, right? Even though I was a drunk reprobate. A sailor, sailor. The only reason I was that way is I never got caught. But I was lost. What does lost people do? Lost things. They're shackled to it. They can't get away from it. Satan has got them and they're possessed by that. They're locked in on that. And only through the grace of God can we ever get free of that. But how God sees your heart, Psalms 44, 21, would not God discover this? For he knows the secrets of the heart. We think that we got a secret and we know what's going on and we keep it to ourselves. Whatever your desires of your flesh, the desires of the eyes, the pride of life, we think we got it all together and nobody else knows our secret, but God does. That's what shattered my heart. November 23rd, 1995, right on that Navy base over there where the chapel, they're saying they're trying to close down the chapel and shut it all down. At that chapel is where I surrendered my life. 
in my full dress whites, like a little baby, I was crying. Because I realized that where I was at, that had I died any time of my past experiences in the military, I'd have busted hell wide open. But a merciful, loving God, a merciful, loving God had compassion. He had patience. He had mercy on me. And he transformed my life. How he, how he sees our heart, he knew I was wickedly wrong. Romans 3, or excuse me, Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift to God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 3, 10. It is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands. No one seeks God. For all have turned aside. Together they have become worthless, and no one does good. How do you see your heart? We're all like sheep gone astray. We have turned from everyone in his own ways, and the Lord has laid it on him, the iniquities of us all. How you see your heart compared to God, you need to look at you are lost. And without God, you are not going anywhere. Proverbs 23, 7 says, As he thinks in his heart, so is he. So if my heart is wickedly deceitful, then I'm a pretty wickedly deceitful person. Now I'm pointing fingers back at me. You, you, you take that up with God where you're at. I don't know where any of you sit. I know most of you in here. I've seen your fruit. A lot of you are lovely, lovely people. Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Now, how many times have you seen a conversation go on where someone, well, I just know in my heart that's the right thing to do. Oh, me or oh, my, again, God knows our heart. Isaiah 64, 6, we have all become like one who is unclean, and our righteous, our righteous deeds are like polluted garments. We all fade like leaves, and our iniquities like the wind is taken away from us. So what do we do with this new information? Psalms 51, 10 says, create in me, O Lord, a clean heart. O God, a new, renew a right spirit within me. King David's words was not, wow, were they so powerful. There's not many days that I don't say that. God, clean me. Restore me to your righteousness. Sometimes I'm like Paul, chapter 7 of Romans. Why do I do the things I know I should not do, but I don't do the things I know I should do? These things that I do, I know I shouldn't do them because we're still going back to our flesh. And we're not seeking him first in the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Because if we seek God first in his righteousness, then all these things will be added on to us. Not the dribble drabble that we bring through life. What do you do with the new information? First John 2 2 said, He is, he is the propitiation of our sins. Not ours, but also for the sins of the world. Jesus Christ on that cross took up every one of our sins. Every sin that you've ever committed and every sin you'll ever commit. And not only for you, but for the whole world. If you remember, he died on that cross over 2,000 years ago. So there's been a lot of sins in the last 2,000 years. And a whole good portion of them was created by Curtis Taylor. But God forgave me. He can forgive you if you do not know him. If you know him, he can still forgive you for the ones you are. He's already forgiven you for them. One of the most powerful verses in the Bible for me, when I read it, I had to read it again. I don't know the address to it, so I'll, I'll look it up in the end and find out. Some of you may already know it. That if we don't forgive those who trespass against us, how can God forgive us for ours? How can I hold anything against anybody that's done something wrong or even compared to what I've done to Christ Jesus? It's quiet in here. It's quiet in here. Romans 10, 9 through 11. 
Jay Barbier's favorite verse. He used to quote this, I mean, just to rattle it out all the time. He didn't finish the Sunday school class. He didn't finish the lesson. He didn't leave your presence unless he said this one. That if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It is for with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. For Scripture says, whoever believeth in him will not be put ashamed. It's heart that you believe, but it's a confession. I had a friend of mine, acquaintance of mine, at one of my last jobs, and he says he knew God. He said he knew God, and I asked him, I said, well, what God do you know? He said, well, I know. Me and the man upstairs, got a, we got an understanding. And in my heart, I'm like, yeah, you do have an understanding. He understands you're lost, and you don't understand that yet. So you got a big misunderstanding. See, what people don't understand is even the devil believes in God. You know the difference between somebody who believes in God and the devil? Nothing. Unless, of course, that person who believes in God can say, Jesus Christ is my Lord. Can you call him your Lord? You'll never hear Satan say that Jesus is his Lord. He knows that he's real. I was listening to David Jeremiah this past week. So this has come from David Jeremiah. He says, all through Jesus' walk, the three years he walked on, everywhere he went, you know who the first person, or the first entity, if you will, that knew who Jesus was? The demonic forces that was there. Every one of them says that you're the king of kings. You're the great. Oh, Lord they would sit there and say, oh, God, don't, don't persecute us. The demons knew who Jesus was, but the people that was there with him did not know. Eternal appearance. There's an external appearance, there's an internal appearance, and there's an eternal appearance. We'll all stand before Jesus. Even in the Sermon on the Mount, it says that. Paul tells us that absent from the body is in the presence of the Lord. And I used to think about that. Well, how can that happen? How can lost people be in presence of the Lord until I read Matthew 7, 21? Even so, this is Matthew 7, 17 and 20. Even so, every good tree bears fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. By their fruit, you'll know them. Matthew 7, 21 to 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast demons out in your name? Did we not do mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, workers of iniquity. When I was teaching youth, I would pick the name of some pop character that all of them knew. And I asked them, would you know that person right now for our conversation? We're going to, we'll pick on a current president. If y'all saw him, do you know who he is? If you saw him in a magazine, would you recognize his picture? If you heard his voice, would you recognize it? If I picked up the phone and I called him and I'm talking to him, said, President Biden, do you know my friend? So-and-so, would he know you? Wouldn't know us. Wouldn't know me. Jesus is saying in Matthew chapter 7, depart from me. I did not know you. It has nothing to do with that. Well, I know Jesus. Yeah, Jesus did this and Jesus. If we're going to have a one-on-one -on -one relationship, we know each other. You know my likes, you know my dislikes, you know my weaknesses, you know my strengths, you know my hobbies, you know I like to eat. Whatever the case is, you know me. But Jesus is saying, depart from me. 
will all have eternal life. Every one of us in this room, regardless of your standing with Christ Jesus, your soul, when your physical body gives out, your soul is going to go rest somewhere. And it's going to meet Jesus Christ. I've done a couple of funerals, and I knew that one of the funerals I was doing was to a lost person. But what I would say was, if he could come back right now, he would tell you Jesus is real. If she could come back right now, she would tell you Jesus is real. We all have eternal life. I don't have time, and I'm looking at my watch right now, and it's telling me, Curtis, you've gone way too long. But Luke chapter 16 talks about the rich man and Lazarus. Most of you in the sound of my voice have heard that story, know that story, and you know that the rich man was really good during the, while he was alive, and the poor man, was a, Lazarus, was a beggar. But the Lazarus went to the bosom of Abraham. Where did the rich man go? Eternal darkness. But he was there. Not only could he remember what was said to him, he remembered his own family, and he knew and he could see the poor man in the bosom of Abraham. He was burning so much, he wanted a little drop of water. That represents there's two gulfs. There's a gulf between it. There's eternal life with Christ Jesus, or there's eternal torment. Skipping ahead to the charge of my dad. He said, son, build your house on a rock. This rock is Jesus. The only way that any home can stand the pains of today is for the father and mother to build their house on Jesus. You're a Wednesday night crowd. Most of you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You may say, Curtis, that's really good, but I already know Jesus. Well, let me ask you a question. Who have you endorsed the Bibles and given to? When have you put your name on the Bible and said, Joey, I want you to have this because I think it'll transform your life and make a special presentation to give them? Your wife and spouse may already know. Maybe all your children know. But how about your grandchildren? Every one of us live in a neighborhood. How about those neighborhood kids? I would go to their parents first. We all have somebody around us. I thought I was being called home. Last story, last lesson. 2002, January, I had a massive blood clot break loose in my right leg. I've told this story to many of you. If it's a rerun, just treat it like I love Lucy. That massive blood clot went to my leg, broke loose, and went to my lungs. I had an 18-inch blood clot, ended up in my right lung. Almost shut me down. To use a nautical phrase, it almost put me to cold steel. That night that I was dying, I said, God, into your hands I submit my spirit. The evil one was there because he tried to put me down then until I said, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Those three wonderful words. The sweetest words I know. And then I had total peace that I was along with God. And he said, Curtis, I'm not calling you home right now. Your mission's not finished. So if my mission's finished, I'm looking at a lot of you right now on the same physical element that I am right now. God's mission for you is not over with. There's somebody you can talk to, somebody you can teach, somebody you can share your testimony to to transform their lives. Because God's not finished with you. Maybe you don't know this, Jesus. Come see me afterwards. Go see Billy. There's other people in this room that can tell you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful night. I lift every person here to you, Lord, and I ask you, Lord God, to anoint their life. Touch their spirit in such a way that you would know today, Lord, that they just had a reunion with you. And give them a breath of your fresh Holy Spirit like a glass of water. Strengthen their walk. Strengthen their desire to know you closer. And be with their families, Lord, as we continue the mission that you've called out for us. To building our houses 
our families on your rock, the foundation of Jesus Christ. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.